I was 12 when this happened. Today's my birthday and I'm turning 13. So one day I went to get groceries from the nearby convenience store. I was curious about what my mom had given me, so I took the list out and read it. Onions, carrots, sauce, chilies, and a lollipop. My five-year-old brother loved lollipops. I did too, but I didn't like them as much as he did. So I bought the items and I went home. Mom wasn't home yet, so I gave my brother a lollipop and took one for myself. I went to my room and was about to start watching Netflix when I heard my brother talking to someone. I was puzzled. My mom hadn't come home yet since I didn't hear the door open. There was no one else here. I got up and went down and saw my brother by the window talking to someone. I walked up to him and he turned around. I asked who he was talking to and his answer scared me. Oh, it was my new friend Alberto. I knew all of his friends, but none of them were named Alberto. I went near the window just to see a dark shadow fade into the woods near my house. That's when my mom came in. She asked why I was looking so frightened. I told her what my brother told me and she wasn't shocked or anything like that. I was a scaredy cat. I would never watch horror movies and if I did, I'd usually not be able to sleep for three nights. But what I'd seen was real. She didn't believe me and told me it was probably my imagination. After a few days without any commotion, my mom said she had to go to her college and she said she had to file some admission paperwork. She left, and my brother took two lollipops out of the packet. I didn't pay much attention to it and went to my room. Then I heard a sucking sort of sound like when a kid's sucking on a toy or a lollipop. I rushed down and saw my brother near the window crying. The window was open and there was a creature who was sucking on both the lollipops. It was black with a huge mouth which spread from one ear to another. It had greasy long hair which was dripping with some sort of liquid that looked like blood. I screamed and ran toward the window and shut it down. I was surprised he didn't do anything. I took my brother and ran upstairs. I could hear it banging on the windows. I took my phone and called the police and then I called my mother. She was mortified. The police said that they would arrive in 10 minutes. We hid in our bathroom because that's what we're supposed to do, right? My brother was still crying, repeating the words, I got one for him and one for me, but why did he take both? I hugged him. My brother was the most annoying kid in the world, but he was my brother. What was 10 minutes felt like 10 hours until the banging stopped and we heard the siren of the police car. My mom burst into the room and hugged us. She then took us downstairs. The police were there. There was blood all over the window and on the carpet. The police didn't get him. I had nightmares for a month after that incident. It was clear that my brother had nightmares too since he woke up crying every night for about two months. After about five months, we moved out. Now, I love my new home. I didn't have any friends at my old home, but here I made two besties. Now as I'm writing this, I remember another thing. The creature was eating the lollipop with one hand, and in the other he had a leg of a human. My name is Mike. When I was 11, me and my parents changed our home address and we moved near the center of the city. But unfortunately, my school was near my old neighborhood and I was responsible for getting to and from school. I used to walk to school, but because of the distance, my parents decided I could take the bus in the morning for myself. They also bought me a smartphone that I kept with me while I was going to school. One Monday morning, when I was on the bus, a woman sat next to me. She was beautiful. She had blonde hair and piercing green eyes. She turned to me and asked, Where are your parents, darling? I answered and told her that I was traveling alone to school. She smiled and touched my hair and said, Could you show me where it is? I said, Yeah, sure. Then she came with me, and after I went inside, she left. The next day, I saw her again, and she sat next to me and asked, What if you skip school today and we go to the bowling alley instead? They have some really cool arcade games and great food. It sounded like a good idea to me, so I happily accepted. She then said, Our stop is near the park, two stops after your school. A friend of mine will take us to the bowling alley from there. After we got off the bus, we started walking towards her friend's car. Then suddenly my mom calls me. Hey Mike, I stopped by your school to bring your gym clothes, but you weren't there. Where are you? I explained everything to my mom. I figured it was just some harmless fun. But my mom suddenly changed her tone and yelled, Run! Those people want to kidnap you! I stopped walking, and then the woman said, What's the matter? 
I said, I have to go to school. My mom busted me. She smiled and said nicely to me, Oh, darling, let's get in the car. It will be much faster than having to wait for the bus to go back. I said, no, thank you. My mom is pretty upset that I skipped school and I don't want to make her matter. The woman's pleasant face quickly changed and she looked very angry. She then suddenly grabbed my left arm and started forcing me towards the car. There was no one around the park at that time of day as it was a very cold and dark morning. I was screaming, help, as hard as I could. Then she put her other hand over my mouth. The man in the car came and helped her shove me in the back seat of the car. The car sped off and then I was taken to a mansion near a forest. I was crying for help as they were taking me to the mansion. Suddenly, a police helicopter saw us and as soon as they heard, police, stop the car, they jumped out of the car and started running. I was lucky because when they kidnapped me, there was a nearby car that saw everything. I was also lucky that my mom called the police as soon as she did because they may not have arrived in time if she hadn't. The people were eventually found, and the man was a registered sex offender. He did 23 years in jail for sexually assaulting a 13-year-old minor, and the woman did 11 years in prison for being his accomplice. Never let children go out alone, as this world is full of wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. My name is Eric. This happened to me a couple years ago. It was winter at the time, so it got dark early. It was me and my friend Chris and Jamal, who were brothers, and my friend Rolando, who all lived in an apartment and wanted to play football, so we went to the park that was close by my apartment. I told my two friends Ian and Johnny to come meet us at the park to hang out. It was right around 6 o'clock and was starting to get dark, and there were some people walking their dogs and little kids with their parents an hour after dark, and there was no one else there. Me and my friend Jamal went to go to the school that was close to the park. We walked and talked for about five minutes, and my friend Johnny texted me saying, Yo, where the f*** you at? And I replied, We just barely left. And he said, Come back. So me and Jamal went back, where we saw Ian and Johnny run up to us. They told me and Jamal that there was some dude watching them, but Chris and Rolando didn't care and were just tossing the ball. They said they were being paranoid. I asked them to describe what the man looked like. He said he had a buzz cut and had a beard. I looked around and saw a man who was watching us behind the school building, poking his head around the corner. I asked them if that was the man, and Ian and Johnny said the man they saw had a beard, and they pointed out how the guy peeking around the corner had no beard, but he still looked really weird, like he didn't have any teeth. After a while, I saw the man they were talking about. He was on the other side of the building the man with no beard was and I got freaked out and said we should leave. So me, Johnny, Ian, and Jamal were all sitting on a bench, and Chris and Rolando were still throwing the football, and they were about 50 feet away. So we yelled over to Chris and Rolando, telling them we were leaving. And then I heard Ian scream, so we all turned around and saw the two men running after us. But Chris and Rolando were far away, so the men were following them for some reason. So we went the direction toward Ethan's house, even though his house was the furthest away. I heard Rolando scream. As soon as we got to Ian's house, me and Johnny threw up outside of his house because we were running so much. We saw Chris and Rolando's face and they were shocked. We went into Ian's house and his parents asked us what happened and we told them the whole story. But Chris and Rolando were so scared and weren't talking. We asked them what happened and they said while they were running, the man with the beard grabbed Rolando's arm until Chris punched the man in the face, and the other man was yelling, They're running! And when they were far from the men, they saw two other men way bigger holding a bat, and one was holding a large knife. Ian's parents called the police, and the men were never caught. Now I hate going outside late. My hometown is a little more than a bump in the road. There's a lot of places like it in the southwestern United States, once thriving cities that can now hardly be called villages. All these little settlements usually have one or two all-in-one stores, nothing more than bumped-up gas station, grocery, convenience stores. In my town's case, there was only one, and my folks happened to own it. I spent most of my time growing up in the place accompanying one or both parents as they worked. By 12, I was working my summers off from school. I didn't like it, but it was the only way to get money, so I did it. 
I was lucky, in hindsight. No other kids I knew had the things I had. My story focuses on a terrifying incident I experienced in the summer before I left for college. I was 18 and excited to get away from home for a while. In the back of the store, we had a small kitchen area where we sold greasy crap like hamburgers and fries. There was a small group of older men who came in every morning for breakfast. They'd sit at a small dining area tucked out of the way, eating, drinking coffee, and gossiping. I'd known most of them my whole life and left them to serve themselves while I watched the front. It was after 8am when this strange man came in. He looked very nervous and messy in general. The first time I saw him, he came in for only about 30 seconds. He looked around very briefly, walked up and down the aisle, and then exited. He returned to his car and sat there alone. It looked like he was having an argument with himself. I assumed that he was leaving and went back to my other work. About a minute passed and I heard the chime on the door go off. I turned to see that it was the same crazy man. He glanced around for a second time, but rather than leave, he approached the counter. I asked him if he needed any help, but got no answer. He glanced around the store again, then looked at me and smiled. I started to ask him again, but was interrupted. Quickly, he pulled a small kitchen knife from his pocket. I freaked out and screamed. I looked out at the gas pumps for help, but no one was there. The man ran forward and hopped over the counter. There was no space for me to escape. This threw me into a total panic. I was wailing and unable to communicate. He grabbed me and ordered me to open the cash register. The situation was chaotic. I was too terrified to think clearly. This just made the crazy guy even more angry. He started slapping me then showed me the knife. This calmed me down enough to push the no sale button and the register sprung open. He threw me down onto the floor and began scooping money from the drawer. I lay there watching as he did this, hoping that he had no more use for me. Suddenly a big shadow appeared over me and grabbed my assailant. The shadow and the crazy guy struggled briefly until the crazy guy disappeared behind the counter. The shadow followed quickly behind. Now I was more confused than scared. I got up to my knees and looked over the counter, and to my amazement, two of the breakfast regulars were trading punches on the robber. In the confusion, I had forgotten completely about them. Being tucked away around the corner made them all but invisible to anyone in the store, including myself. Still a bit disoriented, I remained there watching the men beating up on the guy for at least a minute or two. I'd never seen someone take such a whipping in my life. Only later did I see that one of the men had been slashed by the crazy man. That probably accounted for the extra rough treatment. It reached a point where I figured I better step in before they actually killed this dude. I just asked calmly and they stopped. The attacker laid motionless on the floor while he bled like a pig. I came around the corner and thanked them for their help. While I wrapped the man's wounds and the other gentleman called into the sheriff, everyone told the sheriff their sides and the crazy guy got a free ride to the county jail. My two heroes were awarded with free breakfast for life by my parents. Speaking to my parents, I'm ashamed to say I waited a good four hours until I called them. They were naturally upset and gave me a few days off to recuperate. Instead of talking to someone like I should have, I used the opportunity to just get drunk with my friends. I never really took the time to deal with this, and this would come back to haunt me later in college, but that's a whole different story for another day. Maybe I'll share that with y'all in the future. Thank you all for your time, and please do stay safe. When I was eight years old and was in grade five, I usually sit with my best friend. I was new in school, and she told me a story of how our school principal was murdered. She told me that the school houses his ghost, who walks around the school every night. When it was time to go home, she told me we should visit the basement where the principal was killed. I said no, that I was not interested, but she insisted and I agreed. Then she took me to the basement. When we opened the door to the basement, the stairs were full of dirt and dust, like no one visited that place for years. 
We went all the way down to the basement. It was pitch black, and it was very hard to see anything. The lights were also not working. Then suddenly we heard a bang from upstairs. We both ran and hid behind a broken table. Then suddenly, a person came downstairs with a knife and a plastic bag and was looking around as if he was checking whether or not there was anyone around. The person was walking very close to us. I had to cover my and my friend's mouths. After looking around, the person left, so I told my friend we should run for it. Just as we got up, that person shouted at us. I got to see his face, full of blood and stitches. After that scream, he creepily said, He started to walk towards us. But, but it was creepily fast. The knife in his hand was blood soaked. And as he was walking, he was chanting nursery rhymes. We ran as fast as we could upstairs and thankfully the door wasn't locked. As we got out, we noticed there was not a single soul in the school, not even a guard. We went directly to our class and hid in the closet we put our coats to. We could hear him talk to us outside of the class. Come out, come out wherever you are. I won't hurt you. After a minute, he came into our class and started looking for us. He came near the closet where we were hiding. We were both covering our mouths. He almost opened the closet. But at that moment we heard police sirens and our parents shouting our names. He ran outside of the class and our parents came into school with the police. We both hugged our parents and started to cry. Thankfully the police caught the man. They were looking for him for years. And he was hiding in our school. He was jailed for kidnapping kids and, and killing them. I still can't believe we were that close to death. I'm a female and this happened when I was 13. I was going through a really tough time with being separated from family. Eventually the bottled up feelings got to be enough and I had a meltdown and I told my therapist that I'd contemplated suicide. My therapist then told my foster parent, who called my mom. Long story short, I was put on a 50-50 hold at a nearby hospital. After that, I was sent to a mental hospital. In this hospital, there was a section for kids and adults. It was pretty late now when they had brought me, and I spent the entire time on a bed in the hallway. After I was stripped and searched for cuts, I was shown a room. The room had two beds and was white with just a cubby. In the corner of the room was an empty bed, and next to the door in another corner was a girl. She looked like she was sleeping, and the nurse informed her that I was going to be rooming with her. The room was dark, so I had to tread to my side of the room without turning on the light and waking her up again. But once the nurse left, me and the other girl started talking. I told her why I was there and she talked to me for a little bit. I thought it was all going good until she told me out of nowhere to go get the nurse. And thinking that she needed help, I went and got a nurse. She came and she stood outside of the room and she had asked the girl what was wrong. What the girl told the nurse really freaked me out. She told the nurse in a calm voice, You should move her to a different room. I don't want to kill her. The nurse looked a bit shocked and she had told another nurse to move me. She was then told not to go near me. I truly thought that she was going to try and hurt me even if I was in another room. I'm no longer in that dark place of my life now, but that was the single most scariest moment of my life. About a month ago, my friends and I got some tickets to a professional hockey game in Minneapolis. The game was about a five hour drive from where we lived, so we decided to make a weekend trip out of it. On that Friday afternoon, I was picked up by my friend Kevin. We then drove to pick up my other friend Dan and hit the road. We weren't heading for a motel, but instead to the house of our mutual friend, Jack. 
Jack lived in North Minneapolis, and he offered to let us stay at his house for the weekend. We had all grown up together and were really good friends with him, and he also had a ticket to the hockey game as well, so things were lining up. We arrived at Jack's house early in the morning, and Kevin parked the car out front. He then texted Jack to let him know that we were there. We all got out and walked over to the trunk to grab our bags. It was about this time that we heard tires screeching. We then turned to look at the intersection directly behind us. A green compact car had apparently cut off a dark colored SUV as the driver was proceeding through the intersection. Both vehicles came to a stop and the two male drivers had rolled down their windows and began yelling at each other. Not wanting to get involved, I quickly grabbed my bag and walked up the path towards Jack's house with Dan close behind me. Jack lived in a sort of retrofitted duplex where he rented out the ground floor and someone else lived on the second. Jack had moved to the city fairly recently and we had never visited him until now. So when we entered the walk-in porch, Dan and I weren't sure which door was his. As we stood there, I pulled out my phone to call Jack and asked him to let us in. Meanwhile, Kevin was still in the back of his car rearranging some bags and trying to fix a panel that had popped off during the drive. The two drivers were still yelling at each other, and at this point, they had both exited their vehicles. I didn't have a great view of the situation from the porch, but I could still hear them yelling at each other. To make matters worse, Jack's house was right on the corner, so we were only about 20 yards away from where this was going down. It was way too close for comfort. All of a sudden, we heard a loud pop. Dan and I froze, and I saw Kevin stand up from the back of his car and look around. I immediately thought it might have been a gunshot, but I wasn't 100% sure. I turned to Dan, and from the look on his face, I saw that he also thought it was a gunshot. Oh shit, okay, let's get the hell inside, now. Dan said to me nervously. I unfroze and quickly called Jack, who said that he was on his way to open the door. The two cars peeled off and Kevin joined us on the porch. We all came to the conclusion that a gunshot went off, and that one of the two drivers had fired it during their confrontation. We didn't know who fired the shot or which direction the bullet went. However, Kevin said that he didn't hear any bullets whizzing past him. Jack led us into the house, commenting that he heard a shot go off too, and swearing that nothing like that had ever happened since he moved in. We talked about it for a bit, but no one was hurt, and the drivers were gone now, so we shook it off. Aside from that, we had a great weekend of eating, exploring, and getting drunk at a nail-biter of a hockey game. It was loads of fun, and Jack offered to drive us everywhere since he knew the area. When we were ready to head home that Sunday afternoon, we piled back into Kevin's car. That's when we realized exactly where the bullet had gone. There was a clean bullet hole through Kevin's rearview mirror and windshield. I have no idea how he had missed it before, but there were shards of glass and scattered bits of plastic across his dashboard. We looked around for an entrance hole in the back of the car, but we couldn't find one. That left only one possibility. The bullet came through the open hatch of Kevin's car while he was hunched down in the back trying to fix the panel. Kevin was no more than a foot away from being hit, based on the bullet's trajectory. Kevin would have been shot in the head or the neck if he had been standing straight up. Here's a photo that shows where the bullet went through the car's mirror and windshield. Once the shock of our discovery wore off, we called the police to get a report for insurance purposes. An officer showed up, and Kevin showed her the bullet hole. At first, she was confused. I think for a second she even suspected that we were messing around and fired a gun inside the car. But when Kevin told her all the details, I saw the officer's jaw drop. Unfortunately, none of us could provide the officer with any truly useful information. 
like a detailed description of the shooter or a license plate number. Our next issue was finding out how the heck we were going to drive five hours with a bullet hole through the windshield. Thankfully, a patch-up job of sealer and duct tape from a local hardware store did the trick. On the drive home, we had a solemn conversation where we spent a few hours of hard thinking about the fragility of human life. Even now, I'm not sure if I've fully processed how close Kevin came to dying. I can't even imagine how he feels about it. As for the guy who thought it was a good idea to fire a gun in the middle of a highly populated neighborhood, I either hope he gets his life in order or ends up in jail. This took place the summer of 2010. I remember it was a few days into my summer break. I was going away to Florida to be with my grandpa the week following, so my friends and I decided to hang out until it was time for me to leave. It was five of us, three girls and two boys. For this story, I'll call them Miguel, Denise, Maria, and Eric. Miguel and Denise were twins, as well as the oldest of us, being 15. Maria and Eric were both 14, and they were also a couple at the time, while I was the youngest, being 12. They babied me a lot since I was the only one still in middle school, while the others were already in high school. I remember it was a Thursday afternoon, around 3 or 4. We were sitting on Eric's couch, and we'd been playing FIFA since school let out at 2.05 p.m. Just as Miguel was beating his sisters Manchester United with Liverpool, Eric then suggested we go to the park. We all agreed, bringing our soccer ball. The park was only about two blocks away from Eric's backyard. It had a nice sized playground surrounded by climbable trees. There was a large field just a few yards away from the playground that my friends and I just always seemed to occupy. On the other side of the park was a baseball diamond for little league and softball games, as well as practices. Though, beside the diamond was a small graveyard and a very dense patch of woods. What I never thought was creepy until I got older was that there were small private cemeteries along the side of the park, separated by a tall metal gate. We tend to ignore it a lot since you can't really see it unless you try to. We start our little game. We played for about 30 minutes. My team down by one, when Maria being the most daring, says with an evil smirk on her face, Hey, let's hop the fence to that graveyard. Miguel and Denise then looked at her like she was out of her mind. Are you fucking crazy? What if an undertaker's walking around and we get caught? Miguel protested. Maria lightly shoved him. We're not gonna get caught. Just play it chilled. <laughs> After a few minutes of persuasion, we were all in the same boat and began the five minutes towards the graveyard. The sky was starting to get dark at this time. We dropped our ball and walked over rotten branches to the tall gate. Eric was the first one over, being the tallest. Then it was Maria, then Miguel, then Denise. As mentioned before, I was the youngest, and I was also the smallest. I was also absolutely terrified of heights. When all of the others hopped over, I squeezed in through an opening at the bottom of the fence. We all started to wander around. Fifteen minutes later, Fireflies started to blink around us, and the air got sticky and muggy. The street lights on the block started to come on, though none had really shined in the graveyard. But we still played around nonetheless, catching the bugs and putting them on each other. I, being the daring idiotic kid that I was, would do front flips off of gravestones. I know it was wrong, but we were kind of considered troublemakers in our neighborhood. We laughed and joked around until Maria suddenly stopped. Look, she says. Out in the far distance, behind a big thick tree, was something dark protruding from a small pile of leaves under the setting sun. It looked too weird to be a stick or an old log. I stole a glance at my friends, seeing the curiosity on their faces. <laughs> Maria starts towards the mysterious object, determination in her steps. We all stayed behind, letting the girl explore. As she got closer, 
I could feel my nerves suddenly get bad, like something was just really wrong about this whole situation. Everyone watched as she slows a bit, then stops abruptly right in front of the tree. She stays still for a few seconds, then proceeded with caution. I look over at my friends, who are also watching attentively. We should go. It's getting late and our parents would really want us. I was suddenly interrupted by a loud, blood-curdling scream coming from where Maria had just ventured off to. Eric immediately starts running full speed towards her, and we all followed right behind him. My adrenaline was so high, I could hear nothing but the faintness of our crunching footsteps and my loud heartbeat. Eric then reaches her, looking at what she was looking at, and then backed up. He trips on a branch, falling backwards, eyes wide in utter fear while he stared at the scene. The others and I stopped before getting too close. Groaning and covering our noses, once an unbelievable putrid stench reaches our senses. What is it? Miguel had asked while pinching his nose to block out the strong odor. Eric slowly looks at us, body trembling. B body he says shakily, his skin looking pale in the little bit of daylight we had. Maria had turned her body away from whatever they were seeing, holding her stomach and retching loudly. I pushed past the other kids, keeping my eyes to the ground, and I then made my way to the frightened pair. What I then saw still haunts me to this day. The smell was stronger, almost making me throw up, but once my eyes processed what I was seeing, it's like I forgot how to function completely. It was the body of a black male, completely nude, with his parts missing, and his abdomen covered in multiple stab wounds. He was laying in an awkward position, his leg was bent at an unnatural angle, and his arms were broken through skin, folded behind his head. His face was covered in deep cuts, to the point of being unrecognizable. The wounds were infested with maggots, and his entire body was covered in blood. It seemed as if he had been here for days. I stood frozen, watching as maggots crawled on him, and flies buzzing around the corpse. If I'm honest, I don't even remember if I was breathing. But before I knew it, I felt a really strong tug on my arm. Alto, let's fucking go. We gotta get out of here. Eric then shouts at me impatiently, nearly pulling my arm from its socket. I saw that the others had already taken off, Miguel throwing Maria over his shoulder and running off with her. Before I could even think to move my legs, Eric does the same thing to me. He takes off running as fast as he can. We run along the gate, finding the opening that I had crawled through. Eric gets me to climb over the gate, our friends already on the other side. We ran all the way back to Eric's house. Eric hurries us inside and practically slammed the door shut before locking it. All of us were really scared and really struggling to catch our breaths. A few moments later, I then started crying and Denise consoled me as Miguel yelled at Maria, who looked weak from vomiting then running for 10 minutes. Maria just sat on the couch staring blankly at the floor as the boy raged on. Bro, calm down. We're all scared here. Alto is worst off and all of this screaming isn't helping her. Eric says, pushing the irate boy back. The older kids started trying to figure out what to do as Denise continued to comfort me. Eric ended up calling the police anonymously, then called our parents to come get us. When I got home, I went straight to my room and cried again. The image of that man flashed in my mind every second, though when my siblings asked me what was wrong, I'd come up with a lie. No one knows but us. The reason why I decided to finally get this out is because Denise contacted me on Facebook recently and we caught up. She then asked me if I remember that day at the park all those years ago. I told her that I did and that I'm still pretty messed up from that. She then tells me that a few years after that happened, after she graduated high school, she looked it up. The man was apparently a part of a shady group of people that the police had been after since the early 90s. <laughs> Apparently, he stole thousands of dollars from their boss, and he was murdered for it. So yeah, pretty fucking intense. This all started when me and my best friend Cora were put in a summer camp when we were 13. 
Me and Cora had been best friends since birth, as our mothers were both best friends from high school. Whilst me and Cora had been attending that summer camp, we had both become really good friends with two boys who were in our cabin at that time. They were twins, and their names were Nathan and Joshua. There was another girl in our cabin, as the cabins were very spacious and had a lot of room. Her name was Ellie. No one really talked to her, and we never really paid that much attention to her for quite a while. But as time went on, we sort of figured that we were going to be stuck together and that we might as well had tried to make an effort on getting along with her. We really regretted becoming her friend that night. We were both 15 now, and we had been friends with Ellie for a good two years, and she'd always come over to Cora's place, as the twins were always there too. By the time summer camp was over, we started a little group that had me, Cora, the twins, and Ellie in it. We all started to notice that Ellie would always try to be extra friendly with Nathan, and this really annoyed Cora, as she also liked Nathan. I never really paid much attention to this, however, as I thought Ellie was just trying to be a nice friend to the twins. Over time, Ellie had formed an obsession over Nathan, and we all tried to avoid her. We had all started attending the same college and had graduated together, but we lost contact with Ellie as she was accepted into a different college. Fast forward two years after we had graduated and we had all moved in together. Me and Joshua had become a couple, and so did Cora and Nathan. One night, however, we were all watching a movie when my phone had randomly buzzed. I turned my phone on and had seen that Ellie had messaged not just me, but also Cora, in a group chat on Snapchat we had made years back. She said that she was in our town and wanted to meet up. However, as Cora and Nathan's wedding was coming up, we found it difficult to arrange and find the time to see her. I know I probably shouldn't say this, but me and Cora didn't want to see Ellie again. But we figured that it'd be nice to see her again. We met up in a cafe and had a talk. It was going well until the boys showed up. Ellie saw Nathan and flew out of her chair and hugged him. Nathan, however, found this really scary, and I never understood why. We decided to leave early, as it had gotten dark by the time we were leaving, and Ellie had told us that her boyfriend had kicked her out. So, as I felt bad, I let her stay the night at ours in the guest bedroom. Cora and the boys visually hated this idea. We woke up that morning to a very heavy breakfast prepared for us in the kitchen. Ellie had told us that her boyfriend had wanted her back, and as a sign of gratitude, she made breakfast for us. She said she had to leave for work, and she left. There was a weird stench flowing through the house ever since Ellie had arrived, and it got worse whenever I passed her room. We decided to check it out, and found the most horrifying things in the closet connected to the guest bedroom. Bloody knives were laid out on the desk in the room, and on the walls were photos of us with X's marked on mine and Cora's faces. Ellie had been stalking us. We called the police, and Ellie had been arrested for raping men in their hotel rooms and for attempted murder. I had been messaged before by a girl we used to know from camp. Her name was Jenny, and she claimed that Ellie used to be in Jenny's cabin with her older brother. Ellie had tried to not only kiss, but sleep with Jenny's older brother, which then caused her to be moved to our cabin. We had had someone break in a while before we met Ellie again, which we then found out was all her doing. We used to have this neighbor back when I was 15, and I didn't find this out until years later, but... He basically was the sole reason we ended up moving out of the house we were living in at the time. So the way my dad tells it, it all started when the guy started making something in the shed in his backyard. Obviously, he was entitled to do whatever he wanted on his property, especially during the daylight hours, but my dad said all the sawing and hammering noises were a real pain in the butt. He figured it'd only be a couple of days, but a week went by and the guy was still making all this noise in the evenings and on weekends. It went on late into the night on a bunch of different occasions, and my dad had to go over and threaten to call the cops to get him to knock it off. Seems a little extreme, I know, but dad had already tried asking nicely, and the guy was just a total jerk, so it was the only thing that seemed to work. After that, the guy kept the sawing and hammering to reasonable hours, still a pain apparently, but 
nothing he didn't have the right to. But then, my dad looks over the fence one day and sees the guy carrying a whole bunch of chains into the shed. Then the next thing he knows, the guy is carrying all these shackle-looking things into the shed, the kind you use to keep a person prisoner. Dad asks what he's building in there, but the guy is all, mind your business, mister, saying things like that. My dad is starting to get pretty nervous about the whole thing, and he's close to calling the cops because it was obviously looking incredibly shady, and maybe it'll get the guy to stop hammering and sawing all freaking day too. But still, he holds off for one night too long, and that's when he hears a scream coming from the guy's backyard. He says it was one of those screams of the blood-curdling variety, and he goes outside to listen then hears a few more muffled sounds coming from the shed where the guy was building, whatever it was he was building in there. He tries looking over the fence to get an idea of what's going on and sees our neighbor walking out to the shed, covered in blood, with something sharp and shiny in his hand. But just before he closes the door, Dad said he caught a glimpse of someone strapped onto some kind of big wooden board. That was it. My dad runs back inside, calls the cops, and tells them something messed up is happening in our neighbor's backyard, how he had been building some kind of torture device or whatever, and how he thought he was in the process of basically murdering someone in there. The cops show up, but they don't make it into the backyard. They just drive off after talking to the guy. My dad calls the cops back and asks them what they're thinking, and they need to get into that shed right away because something unspeakable is happening in there. They tell them that they can't get into the guy's place without a warrant. The guy had a bandaged hand and claimed the blood was because he had an accident. The cops seemed happy enough with that explanation and had gone back to their precinct. But, they were in the process of getting a warrant because of my dad's claim that he'd seen a body in there, and because of how urgent it was, it might only be a few hours before they could get one signed by a judge. Then boom, the next day, the cops show back up at the guy's house at like 6am and it wakes my dad up because they were literally sawing a lock off the door to the shed. He watches all freaking morning and get this, they carry out the body he'd seen in that shed. Only it wasn't a body, it was like one of those mannequin type things and it had blood all over it. The guy has actually been building some kind of torture table in his shed only he hadn't actually done anything to anyone, so the guy ended up getting a full apology from the county after they didn't find anything to arrest him over. But still, my dad's not happy knowing he lives next to someone who'd build something like that, and after arguing back and forth with the cops about the guy's right to build some sort of weird torture table, he ends up just being like, screw this, we're moving. He didn't say anything to us at the time because obviously me and my sister were still young and he didn't want anything like that in our heads. But after I had moved out and my sister had graduated college, he ended up telling us at a little reunion dinner. As you can guess, our jaws were on the floor when he was telling us, as we had no idea he was anything but some annoying home improvements nerd. It came up because we were complaining about having to move schools at that age, as me and my sister both lost a bunch of good friends and it sucked having to start at a new school right when I just started at a new one there. He figured the whole thing would be justified to us why we had to move and honestly, I get it. I wouldn't want to live next to a freak like that, either. I live in a state called West Bengal in India, and this incident took place when I was in the ninth grade. I lived in a four-story building with my family, and our apartment was on the first floor. There was this festival going on around our locale called the Durja Puja, which continues for almost a week in our state. It's one of the greatest festivals here, so everyone used to stay out late and spend much more time in the local pandals. On one such day, a rumor started spreading around the town about some thieves who broke into someone's house and beat the homeowner until he became unconscious. The police were on the case, so none of us cared that much about the incident because we thought the criminals were bound to get arrested as soon as possible, until one day. My parents and I returned from the puja late at night. 
Just like every other day, we had our dinner and went to bed. That night, I couldn't sleep well. I was tossing and turning, but finally, I fell asleep. It was around 3 or 4 a.m. when I woke up to the sound of something being sawed. My room was at the very end of the house, and it had a balcony attached to it. I could hear something from there, and definitely knew that someone was sawing the railings of my balcony. My heart stopped. Now, here comes the twist. I still can't figure out what really happened that day. I don't know if it happened out of fear or from something else. I could not move an inch. My body was stone cold, but I was still sweating like a pig. My eyes were wide open, and I couldn't blink. This continued for the next five minutes. Each minute seemed like an hour to me. I could still hear the sawing sound grinding in my eardrums. I wanted to move, but I couldn't. I feared that this might be the thieves. They are definitely going to enter my room and take me away with them. They are going to kill my family. They are going to take everything with them. While I was busy thinking all of this, I suddenly heard someone whistling right by my ear. I tried to turn my head, but I couldn't. Finally, after five whole minutes, I could move. And suddenly, the sound stopped. I looked around my surroundings, and to my surprise, there was nobody around. I got off my bed and grabbed my baseball bat, but before doing anything hasty, I felt the need to wake up my mom. I told her what happened, and she was terrified. Both of us quietly went outside to look for the thieves, but there was no one around. My mother immediately called the local security, and they went to search for the thieves. That night, alone in my room, I couldn't sleep at all, so I went to my parents' room to sleep. The next day, we found out that the house just next to ours had been robbed by some thieves when the owners were not in the house. I was terrified all over again. But I got even more scared when I asked my mother if she'd heard any kind of sound last night, and she replied with a no. My parents' room was right next to mine, and my mother is a light sleeper. That's why it was easy for me to wake her up at night. To this day, I still wonder who it actually was that had whistled right by my ear and what would have happened if I'd never moved. This story takes place during the height of the pandemic in 2020. I had always been a little overweight and lazy. And since there was no one out on the roads, I decided to take up walking. My neighborhood wraps around itself. By the time you made it all the way around, you would have walked an entire mile. The only people I ever saw were this nice couple that walked around the same time that I did. We would always stop and have these nice little chats from time to time. I would even look forward to my walks just to talk to these people. But one day, they vanished. I would never see them out and about. The grass outside of their home became overgrown, and it seemed like parts of their house were damaged from neglect. After a while, curiosity got the best of me, and I would knock on the door whenever I would pass by their house, but I would never get an answer. Now, on the day in question, I had been busy, and missed my daily walk. So I decided to take my walk during the night. I grabbed a flashlight and went on my way. I eventually passed by the house. I then noticed that the front door was open. Being the curious person I was, I walked down the driveway and yelled into the house. Uh, hello? Is there anyone here? All was quiet. But as I stood there, I heard a creak to my right. I peeked inside with my flashlight, and then my light fell upon a tall, rough-looking man, just standing there, grinning at me. I was startled when I saw him. He then lunged towards me and began to chase me. As I mentioned earlier, I was overweight, so I couldn't run very fast. He would have caught up to me if it wasn't for a car passing by. The man ran back inside, and I managed to get away and call the police. When they arrived, 
they found the man in the same spot he was when I first saw him. It wouldn't be till a while later before all the details came out. The man who chased me that night confessed to brutally murdering the couple who lived at the house and burying their bodies in the backyard. He also admitted to torturing them before ending their lives. The night that I walked into the house, he was in the middle of making sure the bodies were not uncovered by the heavy rain. The house was bulldozed after they dug up the bodies and were given a proper burial. The scumbag tried to plead insanity, but the court ruled that out, giving him two life sentences without parole. I sometimes still walk past where the couple once lived, and every time I do, I think about how those two sweet, innocent people were taken out of this world by an absolute monster. One fine day, I was home alone. My mom and dad had gone out for the night and would be back in the morning for their anniversary and said I could have my friend over as company. So I invited him over. Let's call him Jason. We had a great time. We ordered pizza and we had milkshakes for dessert. We watched horror movies and stuffed ourselves until we heard a loud creak coming from upstairs. Creeped out, we immediately thought that it was just a noise from our minds as we were watching a load of horror movies. We went upstairs to see. Our lives were now a horror movie. We froze and didn't know what to do. Stuck, we wasted our chances of phoning the police. We saw a creepy man with his eyes bulging out of his pale skin. His bloodshot eyes did not move, and it was like he stared into our souls. My friend grabbed his phone and phoned the police. I thought the guy would react, but he didn't. He looked like he was in his late 50s. We could see him peering out of a crack. All I could hear was my heart pounding. Yet, he did not peep, nor did the police come as fast as we thought. The harrowing man jumped out of the window and somehow didn't get injured. He ran as fast as he could, only to land in the arms of a policeman. The man was finally taken away and we were told we would never see him again, but that wasn't very reassuring. I'm scarred for life and I will never forget this day or the traumatizing look of his face. A girl, let's call her Bailey, was staying home alone. She stayed home alone with her dog, Pug. Around 1 a.m., she decided to go to sleep. Her dog usually liked to sleep under her bed. At around 2 a.m., she heard a droplet of water. So she went to the kitchen to see, and nothing was there. She thought it was her imagination, so she went back to her room and put her hand under her bed so her dog could lick her. Then, around 15 minutes later, she heard that same droplet and checked the kitchen. Nothing was there. So she went back to her room and put her hand under her bed so her dog could lick her. She was starting to feel scared, but shook it off, and then the same noise was heard again at 3 a.m. This time, she checked the restroom, and she gasped at the sight of her dog who was hanging on the wall. Sadly, drops of blood were dropping, and a note on the side said, humans can lick like dogs too. She locked herself in the restroom. Thankfully, having her phone, she called 911, and the cops came and found a woman and a man. I was 19 years old when this happened to me. I was a sophomore in college, and it was winter break. My parents were busy this Christmas, so my cousin Brody came over to stay with me in my dorm to keep me company. That night, after Brody arrived, we watched some scary videos on YouTube for a little bit, you know, doing random stuff. After a while, my computer died and we got hungry. Brody and I decided to head down to the cafeteria. Unfortunately, there wasn't any food in the cafeteria, so we just decided to go to the nearby 7-Eleven off campus. As we were leaving the room, I noticed an old man sitting at one of the cafeteria tables in the shadowy back corner. 
He looked tall, creepy, and had bloodshot eyes. But what scared me most of all was how he kept vigorously licking his lips like he was hungry. What he was hungry for exactly, I didn't want to stick around to find out. A few minutes later, my cousin Brody and I pulled up outside of the 7-Eleven. Brody rushed inside the store to get a Slurpee, and I decided to look for something sweet. I walked into the candy aisle, and there was the creepy guy from the cafeteria. He had a crazed smile on his face, and his eyes were wide and unfocused. The man said to me, Hey there, what's your name? After a moment of just standing there in fear of the worst, I ran over to where Brody was trying to get the Slurpee machine to work, because it was broken. I told him about the creepy guy, but he just shrugged it off as a coincidence. Still, I was disturbed, and told Brody I'd go wait in the car for him. As I walked outside to the parking lot, I couldn't shake the feeling that somebody was watching me, even though I glanced over my shoulder multiple times and didn't see anybody. When I got to my car, I was surprised to find out that the doors were left unlocked. I got in quickly and checked the back seat because someone could have gotten in, but luckily no one was there. I locked the doors and then got a text from Brody, who said he was going to take a while because he had to use the bathroom. I was annoyed that we had to stay in this shady place even longer but decided to take the time to take a nap. However, after a few minutes, I woke up to a rustling sound behind me. I turned to see the creepy guy sitting in the back seat. As the crazy smile on his face grew even wider, I realized that he had snuck into the trunk because I forgot to lock the doors earlier. We both just sat there because I was paralyzed with fear and couldn't move. After what felt like an eternity, the man pulled out a large rusty knife and let out a deep, creepy laugh. With a scream, I busted out of the car and ran as the man chased after me. Right then, my cousin Brody came out of the store and he was pretty muscular from being an athlete. He was able to knock out the creepy guy. While waiting for the cops to arrive, we decided to wait inside, leaving the man's unconscious body there in the parking lot because it had started to rain. We went inside the 7-Eleven and told the store owner what had happened. All three of us decided to wait by the window, which had fogged up because of the rain outside. The owner quickly wiped it down, and what happened next scared the shit out of me. The creepy guy's body was gone. We rushed outside to find him, and the cops arrived exactly then. We told them what had happened, including how the creepy guy was nowhere to be seen. The police searched the 7-Eleven premises and the surrounding woods, and after some time, they found the creepy guy hiding in the trees. They arrested him, and we found out that he was actually a convicted pedophile and murderer on the run who had escaped from a different state penitentiary. Although he was caught, to this day, I wonder what would have happened to me if my cousin Brody hadn't been there to save me. This happened when I was 19. It was May 20th, 1974, and I was a freshman in college. I was studying, and it was about 2.30 a.m., I looked at my roommate, we'll call her Haley, and I said, are you hungry? She nodded. I told her I was going to McDonald's and if she wanted anything. She texted me what she wanted and I left. I was walking to my car when I saw a man standing outside. He was about two years older than me and he was tall and he had dark black hair. When I walked outside, his eyes turned toward me. I didn't know him, but I still said hi. I was walking to my car and he watched me. I was creeped out by this dude so I just got in my car and I drove off. When I got to the fast food place, I went inside to order. As I ordered, I noticed someone was staring at me from outside. I ignored it because I thought it was some homeless guy. When I paid for my food, I left. The guy wasn't there anymore, so I was relieved. I walked to my car and put the food inside when someone grabbed me from behind. They put their hand over my mouth so I couldn't scream. I was kicking, trying to break free, but they were too strong. They pulled me and pushed me into the trunk of their car. I was crying, begging for God to help me. I could only hear one voice in the car, and what I heard frightened me. Okay, Ted, you've done this before. Rape and kill. I felt my stomach drop. I knew I was in a bad situation, but I had planned my escape in my head. When the trunk opened, the same guy I saw outside of my school was right there. He grabbed my arms and he pulled me into the woods. I was making small talk, 
but I didn't try and irritate him. I told him I didn't know who he was, so I wouldn't tell anyone. He ignored me, but he said, I'm sorry, I don't want to do this, and threw me on the ground. He fell on top of me. I fought him, trying to get him off of me. I grabbed his neck, and I kicked him in the balls. He flipped off of me and I ran. I didn't stop running until I saw a telephone booth. I called the cops and they came immediately. The cops searched everywhere, but didn't find him. They didn't find him until 1978. I later learned that my kidnapper was the notorious serial killer, Ted Bundy. Forgive me for commandeering someone else's story here, but I think it's very relevant to the thread, and although my father wasn't a trucker, this incident closely involves someone who was. Back in the 70s, my dad was an 18-year-old gas station attendant at a 24-hour gas station. One night, dad was the only one working the late shift when one of the sketchiest customers he'd ever laid eyes on walks into the station. My dad said it was really obvious that the guy was concealing something in his pants, and his first thought, which brings on some major panic, is that the guy has a gun on him. Now, a whole lot of truck drivers used to use his station for two reasons. Number one, it had a pretty roomy parking lot, which they'd used to take naps and breaks in, and number two, it was the only place for miles around that they could get a bite to eat. Usually, there could have been up to ten truckers parked up in the lot, but on this particular night, there was only one truck there. Luckily though, the guy just so happened to be in the store with my dad, but since dad didn't know if he was armed or what kind of guy he was, he figured he was still pretty vulnerable. The weird guy starts walking up and down the rows in the store and my dad can tell he's not really looking at anything. Most customers either come in to pay for their gas or went straight to the hot food counter to pick out something to eat. Weird guy looks like he's just biding his time before... He pulls out his gun and robs the store, at least that's what's going through my dad's head. The trucker comes up to the counter while this is happening, puts down a bag of chips and just so happens to look over his shoulder at the sketchy guy. Then this moment of pure understanding occurs. The trucker looks at the sketchy guy, then looks at my dad, then back and forth maybe once or twice more, then asks my dad what was supposed to sound like a totally random question. He says something like, Quiet night, huh? I wouldn't feel safe working at a gas station alone. You keep a gun behind the counter there or something? All my dad had was a bat, and even so, it belonged to the station's owner, but the trucker widens his eyes and mimes a nod at my dad, who suddenly realizes what he's supposed to say in reply. Oh yeah, he says. I got a forty-five right here, always just an arm's length away. The trucker continues to play along and bangs his fist on the counter before kind of shielding the action with his body. Oh yeah? He says. Well check this out. 357 Magnum. Bought it after I saw that movie, Dirty Harry. Not as big a bullet as your 45, but it sure does pack a punch. Some days I just pray some SOB mess with me so I can blow his freaking head off. Right as he says that... The sketchy guy just makes a beeline for the door, gets back into his car, then zooms off down the highway. When the guy had left, the trucker turns back to my dad and says something along the lines of, You know that guy was about to rob you, right? I was going to take a nap out back, but I think I'm more in the mood for coffee after that. Oh, and uh, do yourself a favor. Call the cops. My dad says he always figured guardian angels would be all cherubic, half-naked winged ladies that descend playing harps or whatever. He didn't figure they came in the form of some hairy trucker who smelled like he hadn't showered in three days. But as he puts it, every day is a school day. The guy spent the entire rest of his break hanging around the store making conversation with my dad until the cops showed up and my dad could file a report. The trucker confirmed the story too, backing my dad up when he said it looked like the sketchy guy had a gun stuffed in the back of his pants. Then get this, right in the middle of talking to the cops, both of their radios start buzzing, and they run out of the gas station, get into the patrol car, 
and speed off down the highway with their lights and sirens on. The trucker responds, I hope our friend and his gun didn't find the trouble they were looking for. Only, they had. My dad said he read in the newspaper the next day that the very same guy, based on the description in the paper, had walked into another gas station about 10 miles down the highway. But unlike my dad, the clerk in that station hadn't been so lucky. The guy was the actual owner and operator of the station, tried to resist the robbery, and ended up paying with his life. From what my dad could tell, the sketchy guy pulled his gun, the station owner went for his, and the sketchy guy just pulled the trigger. Boom. Killed him behind his own counter. Now, my dad obviously didn't have a gun, but he said he was panicking just watching the guy walking around the store. If that was him getting robbed by someone with such an itchy trigger finger, he might have made a wrong move or something, and bam. I literally wouldn't even be around today to write this. I think the sketchy guy ended up getting the death penalty too, that or died in some shootout with the cops, maybe even the same cops who attended my dad's call. I can't quite remember which, but dad always mentions him getting what he deserved whenever he tells the story. Now, I don't have to tell you how glad I am of that too, because even though it's so surreal to me, the idea of someone actually hurting my dad is just on a whole other kind of rage that I would feel. Dad's story doesn't just give me a belief in guardian angels, even if they do appear in unconventional forms, but it also makes me believe that there might just be something like divine justice, too. My name is Uriel. This happened to me in Mexico. I would visit my grandmother and my aunt. I would usually go to check on my grandmother and I would help her out with some chores that my aunt couldn't do, like yard work or things that had to do with heavy lifting. One day I was going over to see my grandmother and to see if my aunt needed help with anything as I unlocked the door and entered the house. It was quiet, which was odd as my aunt and grandma would play music or have the TV on. Both are off and I looked around the house to see if I could find my aunt or grandma, but I couldn't find them. But I didn't look in my grandma's room. How do I spit in my grandmother's privacy? I knocked on the door, but no answer. I knocked a second time, but it was quiet. I opened the door to see if she was sleeping. As I opened the door, I saw a lady dressed all in black with her long black hair over her face. She was sitting on my grandma's bed on the edge of the bed. I didn't know who she was. I asked her, who are you? She remained quiet. I asked again, Who are you and how did you get in here? The doors were locked and all the windows had bars, which made it impossible for someone to enter the house. I went outside to the shed to get my machete, which I used to cut the branches in the backyard. I was hoping to use it to threaten her so she would leave, but as soon as I entered the room, she was gone. <laughs> I heard the front door opening. I went to see and found my grandmother and aunt coming back from a walk. My grandmother and aunt saw me and asked me why I had the machete out. I said, there was somebody in your room, Grandma. I told them to stay where they were while I looked around the house to see if the lady was still there. About an hour goes by. I couldn't find nobody. I told them to come back inside. They asked me if I found anything. I said no. The only trace of her being there was the imprint of her sitting on my grandmother's bed. I decided to spend the night to make sure they were safe. A few days passed. Nothing happened until the next day. My grandmother passed away in her sleep. We held a funeral for her a few days after, but I couldn't stop thinking about the lady in black. I told my aunt about it. Her face was pale as soon as I told her everything. She told me what I saw was the lady in black. She is an omen of death. She's unknown if she's a spirit or demon, but she was the reason of my grandmother passing. This happened when I was 21 years old. I lived in California and I was studying to become a doctor. In the post-mortem, as I saw hundreds of dead bodies in my college to be tested and to be operated, well, in first time I freaked out when I saw most disturbing side of a body. 
then slowly I got used to it. It all started when I completed college and I was looking for a house in California. Well, I know nothing about houses and I got my parents to my room where I lived. We searched a lot of houses in online and in reality. After a week, we visited the website and we saw a really beautiful house for only $40 with two bedrooms and wardrobes. We were excited and we went to the house and knocked the door to the house. After five minutes, a tall lady who was in her mid-fifties and with long hair and a cat in her hand opened the door. She greeted us and we saw the house. When we entered, a very foul smell was coming. It was something like which was dead and rotting. I looked around and I saw a very odd looking voltage box in the hall of the house. And as I saw it, the smell got worse and stronger. I asked the lady what the smell was. And she said that a squirrel had died in the voltage box and she would clean it when we moved in. I thought this was normal and it happened in every house which was empty. So I shrugged it off. When we saw the full house, we liked it and we gave the advance and I moved in. After a few weeks later, one day, when my girlfriend came to visit me for Christmas, she liked the house when she came in and said that I was very lucky to get this house for a cheap rent. I nodded and my girlfriend wanted to use the bathroom, so I showed the bathroom and she went there. And after 10 seconds, she came back again to me and said that the lights were not working. I then remembered my electrician came yesterday to work on a switch and he had turned the mains off. So I went and turned on the mains with my girlfriend when that's when my life was hell. My girlfriend screamed as the switch box opened and there was a person's body chopped into multiple pieces in that place. We then went to our landlady's house and rang the bell and from the window a gun pointed and shot my girlfriend and I called 911 and an ambulance for my girlfriend. The cops arrived in 5 minutes and they caught the lady. My parents arrived and my girlfriend was taken to the hospital and she survived. Then an officer said about the lady. Turns out she was a crazy psychopath who had killed a 30 year old man and hid his body in our voltage box. What was even worse is she was plotting to kill me the day I found the body. I moved out of the house and I never ever want to go to that apartment again. This happened to me a couple weeks ago, but it still haunts me to this day. This started when I moved into a new bedroom. It was really cool at first, but I realized I didn't have any pillows. I decided to make a pillow out of old t-shirts. I thought the room could use a funky pillow. It took a while, but when the last stitch was made, I was very happy with the finished product. Although I had made the decision to draw a face on it. The face wasn't creepy in any way, just a cute face. I called the new pillow Mushroom, and I really liked sleeping with him. Until he began to act strange. One day I went out to my friend's house for the day. I left Mushroom in an upright position on my bed. When I came back, however, he was nowhere. I looked everywhere, until I eventually found him under my bed. It was very creepy because I didn't know who did it. My brother was at cricket and I don't think my parents would do it. Since I like mushrooms so much, I just brushed it off and continued on with my day. To be honest, this happened repeatedly for the next couple of days. The weird thing was he always went back to the same spot under my bed. I still brushed it off, and I kept mushroom. That night, I was quite restless, always tossing and turning. When I eventually got up, it was 8 a.m. I looked around, and I realized that Mushroom wasn't on my bed anymore. I looked under my bed, hoping to see Mushroom staring back at me. I sighed when I saw Mushroom in the same position. I grabbed him and yanked him up from under the bed. I looked at him. Something was different. One of his eyes that had been drawn on was wet, and the pen marks were draining down his face. It was very creepy because I had no water in my room last night. 
I was really creeped out, but brushing it off, I went on with my day again. The next night, I was tired and restless, not being able to sleep. I drifted off eventually and woke up early, only to find that Mushroom had gone under my bed again. This time, though, half of his face was wet and slowly draining away from his face. Again, I had no water in my room last night. I don't know how this happened. I really don't know what to do. I'm scared because I asked my brother and he is as scared as me. Someone or something is doing this. I really don't know why. It may be hard to believe, but this actually happened to me. I remember when I first came to this house. It looked old and it was really small. It had wooden floors and it was a ranch-style house. The next day, my brother and I were sleeping when suddenly I heard some noise. It sounded like a baby crying. I thought it was just the neighbor's child and started to get back to sleep again. But then I saw it. It had a baby-looking face and made this scary baby sound. It had sharp nails and its body looked like an animal's. And then it said, Adopt me, mommy and let out a scary baby sound again. Then I blacked out. When I woke up, it was the morning, and I asked my brother if he had heard anything. He said that he heard a baby sound, but he thought he was just dreaming. I asked him what kind of dream, and he said there was a baby with an animal body and claws. Then I knew it. I quickly told our mom, and we moved out. From then on, I never touched or went anywhere near any babies ever again because it reminded me of that creepy thing that I saw that night. Mm -hmm.